This is the Liddy and Spin with the Liddy Lunch, Tim Doll, episode number 246. Once wow. again, there we are, transcendental and transnational, transatlantic, transglobal hobo jet setting. Oh, yes. I, I just got back from a little Northeast tour. Uh, when did I get back? I, and I'm in the Northwest. <laughs> yes. So, but I'm back in New York now. And uh, that, that was fun. And uh, I don't know. I got, I have to, Going overseas in a few weeks, so it's it will continue. That's yes, you and then we'll, we'll and we'll see each other in, in about a month or so at there. But we'll see, uh, I can't wait. We'll see each other in New York before I go. You know, um, I was just again at the Rabbit Box where I am at the Rabbit Box. Oh, of course, yes. now I'm in my tiki shed. Splendid I, establishment. I had, a, I had a few people say that our performance of Murderous again just they can't get it out of their head. It blew their mind. That was you, me, and Matt Nelson. Yeah, and, that's a fun um, band. Nice to nice to hear that. You know, well, it's some, stuck, it's stuck like <laughs> silly buddy. You know that band is one of those bands where it just kind of takes over on its own. We tap into some other some other dimension, and it just kind of I don't. No one's even thinking. It just just starts coming out. It's, it's really sat fun. the satanic symphonies. Yeah. Well, and speaking of thinking or not, Tim, I don't know if this ever happens to you. I find that, I don't know if this is actually related to, you know, the effect that when you walk into another room, you pass a doorway, you forget why you were there. Well, anyway. It happens to uh, everyone a little bit. Yeah, well, neuroscience is now shedding light on the mystery of mind blinking. <laughs> mind blinking. <laughs> I so like that term. Mind blinking. The Journal of Neuroscience, they say that, you know, it happens, but there is an actual marked reduction in brain activity across several key regions. So they're trying to understand more about consciousness and our ability to even report our experiences. So unlike mental states with reportable content, you know, like daydreaming or engaging in a task, mind blanking represents a unique state of consciousness, though that it lacks neural characterization so it's, it's very very strange so it's the perfect case of unconscious yet reportable moments so when you're mind blanking you actually know that your mind blanking. yes we all know that we all know but, that so it's not as if the blankety blankety blank removes the blank consciousness so anyway they're doing studies on this just trying to figure out exactly what's happening here but there is a, a widespread brain deactivation during instances of this i actually think it might be a cleansing you know act non-activity in the prefrontal cortex it, it also could be your subconscious or uh, unconscious I, I always mistake the two the difference between those but it might be saying like hey what you're doing is not that important and uh well i just and, you need to flush the toilet of your brain space your brain pan occasionally i think well I mean, yoga nidra which is kind of like a newer newer form of yoga which is not really stretching it's kind of like people it's, it's trying to do that it's trying to skate that line of the subconscious and conscious you want to be aware of everything but not of anything it's kind of like you're falling asleep but you can't fall asleep because that's taking that's taking over right and, uh, the, yeah those those kind of haze zones little blinking between those trap doors <laughs> of the brain. I mean, blinking and blinking, blinking and blinking. <laughs> well, Lydia, I mean, I, I know you don't sleep so much, but what, what about uh, those moments when you're just falling asleep or just waking up or, and you're, and you're oh, yeah. solving all these problems and then it's like catching Write, water, it, writing it lyrics, writing stories, yeah. <laughs> booking tours. Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> oh, the brain, the brain. Uh, well, anyway, here, here's something that I think you may have experienced, but only under the right stimulants. So man has strange disorder that turns everyone he sees into a demon. Now there are schizophrenia. Well, okay. So in the medical journal of the Lancet, a guy named Victor Shara, one morning in 2020, woke to find that everyone around him looked like a horrible satanic demon. And where do you think he might have been at the time? Give the most impractical place or maybe most obvious place the dmv i don't know <laughs> <laughs> beverly hills <laughs> okay okay that makes sense there you go so right. when he looked at people's faces they appeared demon-like with their ears noses and mouths stretched back deep grooves in their forehead it's kind of cute these little demons he imagined but he had a condition called prosopometamorphosia or pmo that's a mouthful and no one knows exactly how it happens or why though 
Sharad himself guesses maybe it was a recent bout of carbon monoxide poisoning. Maybe. Or a significant head injury 15 years earlier when he slammed his head against some concrete. So it wasn't meth. It wasn't like a meth binge. It wasn't LSD. It wasn't mushrooms. But anyway, don't worry, Tim. This particular affliction (laughs) is very rare. I would assume so. It's unlike most other hallucinatory illnesses. People with PMO know something is messed up with their perception of reality. So is that better or is that worse? So was he incarcerated? Like, how, how was this all contained and, and no, explained? No. I mean, and- well, the thing is, he just woke up one day and suddenly, there you go. So, of course, he, he goes to the doctor and they're like, he was freaking out. And, um, and he, But he found that wearing glasses with green lenses can help. And this effect Whoa. doesn't occur when he's looking at screens. So recently he made an effort to be around more people <laughs> so that he could random sight of a gremlin like humanoid in his periphery doesn't turn him into the Joker. Good for him. Is he single? Anyway, is he say, is he out there yeah. uh, schmoozing and trying to. He's a single right now, <laughs> but uh, there's no cure for this problem. No, I'm just wondering like, if he sees a woman or, or a male or whatever he's into. Is that difficult suddenly? Like, oh, my God. This well, is a, a, a demon. Have- you know, most of the demons I know, they're only demonic on the inside, and often they're disguised as pretty attractive little nice. creatures running around there to just bug us somehow. There must have been some, I wouldn't say it was necessarily demonic possession, but... No, I, I would, no, no, no. Look, I would say carbon monoxide, which is what, you know, a lot of people when they're having paranormal experiences in houses, hearing things, seeing oh, right. things, it's because of carbon monoxide poisoning, you know, you know, the leaking of gas. So... This is possible that it's just gone in one direction. And then, the, you know, the banging of the head on concrete, which, you know, my, he- my head has hit itself repeatedly on marble floors, but that was in my youth. And I think it knocked sense into me. So, you, well, yeah, yeah, you're only getting friendlier. Usually head traumas make people meaner. You're, you're only getting friendlier. It's yeah, the reverse. It's, nah, I'm, I'm a contrarian. What can you say? Well, yeah. some, some I don't know if this guy had a head injury or what, but Ramondo <laughs> Stanley was on a two-hour crime spree um, being chased. The cops just couldn't catch him. This is, this is actually up near where you are. It's in Vancouver. Uh, so it starts out with just some little vandalizing. Then he starts stealing stuff. And then, and then they're like, hey, get back here. I think he stole some power tools. But he kept the power <laughs> tools. And then like he got got on a bike and then took, took off. And we're like, hey, stop that guy. He Not stole smart enough to steal a car. <laughs> so, so then, I don't know why he stopped, but he decided to go into a store and then right. he stole someone's phone, like like someone that works there. And the guy's like, hey, what are you doing? And then he punched the guy and then ran out of the store with the phone. Well, then he ended up on the roof uh, of one of these other stores near there and started throwing bricks. And people were like, hey, what's going on, cops? And they were kind of like, get down from there. But then he started using uh, phone lines as a as a tightrope. But there's two of them. So there's whole wait, 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 wait. Phone yes. lines as and- a yeah, yeah, Tyro, but he had two of them. So he had one, he had, he had one gripping, you know, his, his hands were gripping one above him, and he was like, his feet were on the other. Of course, I guess these things are pretty strong. He's lucky they weren't power lines. I don't know if he knew, but but they weren't. So he wasn't electrocuted, but he was up there for 45 minutes, and they're like, get down from there, blah, blah, blah. After 45 minutes, he finally lost his grip, and he was lucky. The, the fire engine was below him, and he just kind of landed on that, and he was kind of okay. And then they arrested him, and well, that was his day. I don't know. Well, okay. No Speaking one knows what possessed this guy. <laughs> another strange arrest for, you know, I, I don't find this really too horrifying. And I, again, I, Oregon man arrested after allegedly rubbing women's feet on his face against their will. Did I tell I, you the story I, already? No, <laughs> no, no, but how did that happen without them like kicking him in the face? Like, how is that well, even yeah, I, realized? Well, this, is, this is what I'm saying, but two victims told local authorities that. You know, they responded to an ad in Craigslist. I can't even believe Craigslist still exists for a housekeeper. And so <laughs> a woman reportedly visited 55-year-old Jimmy Lou's home in the town of Aloha after answering his Craigslist ad. He was seeking a housekeeper. So not long after she arrived, she directed the women to unwanted contact by grabbing their bare feet. I don't even know how he got their feet naked yeah. and rubbing them on his face. A woman left the house and called the police. I mean, okay, maybe he should have just asked because I know any number of women that wouldn't mind rubbing their stinky fucking feet 
right in somebody's face. A little shrimp and goes a long way. I'm just saying. Well, that's a terrific story. <laughs> he was arrested <laughs> third degree sex abuse and attempted harassment. They're urging anyone else to come forward. I think this is very low on the list of sex crimes, especially we know every week now there's more celebrities in the news. Sean P. Diddy, I guess P stands for Pussy Snatching Diddy. Oh, God. Uh, is in the news. I mean, you know, whatever. Rubbing feet, no biggie. Come yeah, on. I, 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 something tells me, it's just a hunch, not scientific, that, that men tend to be more into foot fetishes and women tend to be more into hand fetishes. I mean, I, I could uh, be wrong. Uh, just something yeah, tells you know, me that's the, that's the case. Well, I'm into, I'm an arm fetishist, so I guess the hand is down there as well, but uh, no, I, I do not know. You're right. Enough yeah, I, I don't think women are into the feet as much. Maybe some are. But uh, well, can you blame them? But yeah, I must say, Tim, if I must reveal, you do have very nice feet, but I don't know. You rub them against my face, you're going to get a kick in the ball. I, 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 I don't like showcasing my feet. I don't, I don't even think well, about I've them. Seen the, I've seen yeah. those twinkle toes numerous times <laughs> when you're wearing your slippers around an Airbnb. You can't hide those <laughs> things from me. Those oh, are pretty boy. Those are pretty cute tootsies. Just <laughs> keep them away from me. Yeah, <laughs> no. Don't worry, I'm not planning on doing anything with those uh, you know, besides your hand, walk. I, I, your hands are one thing, you're right. But, you know, I do know those arms are hairless, so you better watch yourself the next time we meet up. So I'm just saying. Oh, oh boy. <laughs> I'm, getting well, little, they, I'm getting a little ticky ticky tavi over here in my hut. <laughs> Cheers. They're not hairless. No, I mean, I don't wax them. Just, I just got the Scandinavian DNA. So I, hey. I just, it's got a lot, just lighter hair that's a little finer. Yeah, you've, got less, you've got less hair on your arms than I have on my cheeks <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> uh, right. but mine is still soft and i'm rubbing it now damn that feels good Ooh. anyway uh, as you can tell i'm a bit frisky you are having, having a good been time on tour for quite a few weeks yeah, jumping around quite a bit um oh, yeah. it's not going to stop for a while and that's no, it it is when you're in it that's what happens when you're a hobos and road doggy eh? you gotta just keep that, it on the road yes you keep on um, pumping them out uh well, let's see i, I got i don't know there, there's a there's a uh bulldozer stolen in georgia and and the um, seventy five thousand pound bulldozer oh god those things go up to 30 miles an hour and then of course the cops couldn't stop this thing <laughs> so they had to take out their bulldozer oh. and that, and so then it was like a dueling bulldozer oh like, my god up, like, the monster trucks <laughs> yeah and then the guy finally they they got him they i mean what him. the hell was he gonna do with it you know what i'm saying i think he got fired from the construction job oh, okay and, that makes and sense and he went yeah, out yeah. drinking one day and he said here here yeah. it comes here's um, I'm taking it. Here's my pay. Here's my paycheck. I mean, this this Baltimore Bridge thing, this collision. Oh, of course, I mean, cons- that's absolutely horrendous. conspiracy theories galore. Of course. Oh, they, they- please. That same fucking fair container ship crashed previously. I mean, how do you not know the size of what you're driving and the size of the? Br- it's not like a plane that comes in so fast. I mean, a little. You'd think you'd have some visual warning that there's a bridge coming that you can't freaking so fit under. So it's not a cut bridge. It's not one that a drawbridge. It's not a right. drawbridge. It's, it's uh, it was actually a stationary bridge that he slammed into. I actually haven't read so much about this. I just know it's a disaster. Well, you know what? I mean, there are the details are still forthcoming. All we're getting is pictures of it. And I mean, I don't know whether it was a, you know, a. a Bridge that cars go. What it? I don't yeah, know yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, what? It, what? What? The it, McMahons, I mean, it, the McMahons who who live in Baltimore, say they drive over drive over that fucking thing every day. Well, they ain't Sorry. doing it anymore. I think it's no, no, gonna, no. Well, they're going to be like what I'm doing in about a half an hour, taking the ferry to the oh, island. Are you you going to Vancouver? I'm going to Vashon and then coming back to Seattle Ooh. and then going to Vancouver Maybe. and going to Portland and coming keep back your eyes Seattle. open. You might see some killer whales out there. I'm gonna. Trust me, they hang around there. I'm gonna be. Have, I'm gonna have my my binoculars at the ready. So all I know is that for right now, because I got a show to do. So yes. I got all right. Move on. This is the Lydian Spin with Timothy Seymour Doll. This guest today is Dan Levinson, another conceptual. I don't even know what. I don't even know how to sum this guy up. He's got so many incredible concepts, and I urge everyone to go to his website. And here we're gonna have a nice little chat with the. Chuckling Dan Levinson, episode 260, What the Motherfuck Ever, 46. See you soon. This is the Lydian Spin with Lydia Lunch, Tim Dahl, 
and Dan Levinson, somebody that came to me via Joseph Keckler, who came to me through Bibby Hansen, and that's how it works with the connective tissue of this, our audio museum. Very happy to have you here with us today, my friend. Thank you so much. I'm happy to be here. Yeah, I'm nervous. Why are you nervous? Yeah. But, I don't know. What are we going to talk about? But, but we've, uh, we've, we've 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 danced together before. How could you be nervous? We have danced together. That's true. And you gave me my mantra, you know, which I compulsively forget. For some I'm going to tell you again because I just had to <laughs> give it to somebody else in Australia every day. You know, and I will quote uh, David Mamet or misquote Mark Twain, however you like it. Worry is the interest on a debt you may never incur. Come on, Dan, See, I repeat never, after me. I, I never knew the attribution. Ah, I, well, now I, you I, do. I, yeah, yeah. Uh, one more time. Shall we say it together? Yes. Worry Slowly is the interest, interest on a debt, a debt you may, you never, may never have to repay. No, yeah, you, may never, you may never incur. You may never incur. Damn, All right. Well, see, I'm going to tattoo on you, on you when I see you next week. Well, in LA. Uh, the, the other one is, of course, fear, false evidence appearing real. Oh, wow. Uh, the other one is the guilty are always suspicious. Uh, uh, I, I'm uh, I'm uh, due for a lot of tattoos all of a sudden. <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> so, so, Dan, you're now based in Los Angeles. You're very hard to describe, which is why you're fantastic to be part of this cult of the Lydian spin. Well, I'm you're... six foot four. I'm I'm muscular, tan. <laughs> that's <laughs> that's all you need to know. We really don't need to know that because you have nothing in common with Tan that. Tanning's not in fashion these days, though. <laughs> Tanning's not really in fashion. Tanning someone's hide never goes out. But you're you're basically the same way I consider myself more of a conceptual artist then, because you work in various formats, including performance, video painting, sculpture, installation. You, unlike myself, though, did go to the Royal College of Art in London and Oberlin, which, you know, uh, quite a few of our friends, Matt Nelson, who plays with Tim and I, many other people went to Oberlin. We play yeah. Peter Oberlin. Evans, Peter Evans. Who Tim uh, Dahl just came off a tour with uh, Peter Evans, great yes. trumpet player. Bra so. Brian Chase from Yeah, Yeah, Yeah. Well, a lot of people oh, have come yeah, out of there. Yeah, yeah. So and, and first of all, let's let's go back to the beginning. So yeah. You were you were born in New York, is that right? Were you born in New York? Yeah, I was uh, in uh, Beth Israel Hospital. I'm not doesn't exist anymore, I think. I'm glad you're they still felt, here with us, though. They felt they couldn't, you know, after I was born there, they felt they couldn't top that. So Throw that, away the key. Shut down. Lock, yeah, exactly. lock it down. It could, it could be now a penal colony for all we know. So what, what, what were you doing in New York? Like, say you're 10 years old. I mean, I don't really know how old you are. It doesn't matter. But what, were you, what did you start getting into as a young whippersnapper, soon to become uh, a conceptual artist? Well, we, to, to, uh, to be honest, we moved to New York. Uh, I mean, so we, sorry, we moved to Cambridge when I was still in preschool. So my memories of New York involve like eating dirt in uh, the in the playground in Washington Square Park. Were, you, were your parents uh, uh, professors? No, uh, my dad was uh, studying to get a PhD in psychology. He was at the new school. My mom was uh, teaching English, I think to high school kids. And they had lived in New York for a decade before I was born. And then, uh, you know, I'm not exactly sure why. There were, you know, they were kind of middle class bohemian types. And I think a lot of those people were moving to Cambridge. That neither, neither one. I mean, my mom is a retired community college professor. So, okay. but n there's no connection to Harvard or, or MIT. Okay. All right. So, then, so what was Cambridge like for you? <laughs> growing up in Cambridge as a, as a kid <laughs> I don't know you know I was thinking about it like because I was trying to think what kind of questions is Lydia Lunch going to ask me and I think like I was thinking about my work and how it evolved in my worldview and I think even though my parents were far from fire breathing radicals or you know beatniks or anything they always talked about the 60s in New York as this really wild time, like a revolutionary period. And I think it transformed them both, you know? And I think growing up in Cambridge, Massachusetts in the 80s, 
I felt somehow like I was born after the fact, you know, after the party was over. Um, and I think that that, even though I, you know, I'm not a historian, I don't know that much about the 60s and you know, the <laughs> civil rights movement and the <laughs> anti-war movement. I think that that idea that I was born after events, after these major events had a, an impact on me. And I guess I was curious to know, Lydia, like what you have to say about that, like the transformation of the 60s and 70s into the 80s. Well, this is not about nice me, although, yeah. although what isn't, but I've <laughs> I guess said I it. wanted to know if you. Well, look, I've said it many times before. It's like my generation who, you know, if you're eight years old or, you know, if born in 59 as I was, you know, we had the, the luxury and the curse of witnessing parts of the Vietnam War, the Kennedy assassination, the summer of love, the summer of hate fucking by Charles Manson, Nixon. So all of what was supposed to be a radicalizing of the 60s via consciousness and action really fell into a nihilism because of what failed and then turned us into the generation of, you know, hate mongers that we did become, which then translated into some very ugly art. Now, yeah, you yeah. who claims you missed the party <laughs> to very colorful art. And <laughs> what's interesting to me is because you work in many for people that, that haven't they will go to your website. But what I like is you work both with found objects, books, wood. Um, you age them or they're aged. I don't know. But then the other side of that is you work with these very concentric cut-ups, like cons colorful concentric circles. I think one of the so one of the series of that was either red, white, black, and green. I mean, you work within this color pattern, which is interesting. And then they're cut. So there's a really big difference. There's no real relation. I'm just naming two types of your art that are Thank disparate, you, you know, you. and uh, uh, both of which I really, I mean, I really like anything wood and found that could be junk books you've also done, but also let your, your theory, your concept is what I want to get into, which is that you have invented this imaginary school based in Zurich and you, through a computer at one point, took, correct me when I'm wrong, took all the names in a phone book in Switzerland, cut them into something, then extracted from almost pulling it out of the hat or the computer, names that you would assign your artwork to, each one having a unique name by an imaginary artist. Am I nutshelling? Yeah, I'm blown away. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I can't even believe I said all that. I and I just woke up. I mean, whatever. I'm gonna, you're going to have to write my uh, catalog essay. Yeah, here we go. Well, you know, I used to charge by the hour, the, 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 the minute. Now it's by the letter. That's not a problem. I'll all right. It. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, that's that's basically right. I mean, uh, I all my work has to do with this imaginary Swiss art school. Uh, that exists in an imaginary modernist past <laughs> in an imaginary Switzerland. And, and wait a second, I, is this because yeah. you you had to invent, it's almost like your play friends because of the absence of activity in Cambridge as a youth? Like, I missed the party. Now you invented your whole fucking school. There's yeah. your party, Dan. You are your yeah. party. <laughs> yes, that's it. That's it exactly. I mean, I don't, I, you know, like, I'm not so that I'm popular, like, you know, I have one friend that's Joseph Keckler, and, and now you too. Yeah. So I have three friends. Oh, no. oh, do not undersell. But you have many awards. You have more awards than I have friends. What are you talking about? But I yeah. don't, you know, I don't feel that, like, you know, going to art school in the 90s that I was part of, like, some great world-changing art movement, the way... It happened in the past. So I think it's partly exactly what you're pointing to that I I felt like I had to kind of create that or at least, you know, find some way to talk about that um, that absence in my life. Like in order to be great, you have to be part of something that's greater than yourself. You know, I, I don't know if it's possible to be just like, <laughs> you know. Well, I don't know. Just go ask stuff. any Go ask any planet or star that now are, you know, standing alone or a black hole. I don't know how many friends they have, and they're pretty fucking great. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, well, that's they have, mag- good, they have uh, magnet. They have magnetism. That's for sure. So. That's, that's, that's a I'm good saying. analogy. I yeah. guess. So uh, you know, I think that's part of it. And then, like you know, the paintings are. I've kind of been working on what the curriculum of this imaginary art school would be, and it's like, it's my impression of what modernism was, but kind of exaggerated. So it's very rules based. It's about like if you were a musician just practicing your scales and doing these basic exercises before you actually play the music. So that's what this uh, curriculum is about. And then when I make the paintings, I try to follow the rules of this curriculum and do uh, student exercises. So the paintings represent student exercises that uh, imaginary art students did in order to like complete their assignments So they kind of like fall below the level of what, you know, a professional artwork would be or what like a masterpiece would be. They're like, wait, 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 wait. I I refuse to accept that these are not professional art pieces or below masterpieces, (laughs) as I've seen a lot of shit selling for millions of dollars that they consider masterpieces. And I consider bastardizations of art in general. So I'm going to refute that for, for a minute there. And now the interesting thing is, it's as, as what you were just saying, as a school of art you have invented, creating under these various names, but within those names is a fixed rigidity of style. For instance, yeah. the concentric paintings. It's not like every personality. It's not like my Lydian jukebox, which every disparate personality might have a different sound voice or genre. You have a connective collective of when you're doing a specific part of your art academy where you are not only the professor but every fucking student as well yeah that's exactly right i mean they're not you know i i picture the the students as being students so they're not really like individual artists yet and the paintings (laughs) are like you know the the analogy would be just practicing scales with a metronome you know they're they're trying to learn about color. They're trying to learn about form, composition, formal things like that. You keep on talking and about scales, and you got a keyboard behind you. Do you practice yeah. scales? <laughs> no, I'm really You ashamed. don't? I, I've been playing piano, like, since I was a kid, and I'm terrible at it. And that that's partly because I don't practice, you know? Yeah. I I'm just too busy practicing painting. Yeah, exactly. Well, you know, like, when I studied art, I didn't, I didn't, get a formal modernist art education. Like I didn't learn about color theory or harmony. Or, so this is or literally a fantasy of yours. This is actually a fantasy. Yeah, it is a fantasy, you know, and the thing about like, <laughs> I well, really, wait a second, yeah, a yeah. fantasy that's had, oh, maybe a hundred exhibits, but has, has, has been in exhibitions a hundred times, has yeah. won about 12 different high powered brands. And considering the fact you only have two or three friends, you have a lot of admirers <laughs> and followers yes. and you have a lot of work under your belt. So I don't even know what the question was, but however. Well, I know what my, you know, I'm going to avoid the temptation to turn all the questions back onto Lydia. It, but won't <laughs> it, won't work. it won't work. It won't work. But, you know, the thing that you said about, like, you've seen a lot of professional art that you thought sucked is important to me because there's, to me, it's always seemed like a contra- that I the term professional artist has always seemed like a contradiction in terms because to be a real artist, you kind of have to remain an amateur or remain a student. And once you turn it into a profession, there's some way in which it's less than what it was. Uh, You know, I don't know if I'm expressing that right. No, but isn't this just a byproduct of, you know, commodified art, you know, of the industrial revolution. It isn't just a byproduct of our environment. And maybe as we head into the tech revolution or we've arrived to it, you know, where's that going, right? I, obviously, now since commodified art, you have international money laundering and and rich people moving assets around, basically unregulated. But um, yeah, where is this going? Well, where, where, where is this okay, going? Dad, well, Dad, I just had, Dad, I just had a concept for your many <laughs> artists in your one man school, which yeah. is instead of selling paintings, maybe you've done this already. You could just ask for uh, money to send them all to continued art school under your auspice. So it would be more like a go fund us project. 
I love that idea. I don't have that kind <laughs> of like I don't even you know, hustler have mentality. I, I, I heard there's this artist, Italian artist, Maurizio Catalan, and I heard that he invented an art prize to send one Italian artist to New York City and he raised all this money and then he awarded it to himself. I'm probably Perfect. I'm probably mangling that anecdote, but like I, I think I, that's never the, come up with something like that. Well, we just did. So I'll be counting yeah, all right. on you to send me to your art school. All right. <laughs> Put my name in a hat, mangle it. I certainly am an, am an amateur artist in many forms, I admit it. And I guess that means I'm a real original. You know, like I look, I wanted to like respond to what Tim said, even though I feel like I'm in over my head. I'm not an art theorist or an art historian, and I don't want to be. I don't want to be too pretentious on the Lydian uh, Spin podcast. Because we're but, all bohemian bo you know, bohozos. Yeah, like <laughs> co commodified art that is kind of like the problem. Like if I make a painting and I know that I'm doing it for money, then that's, you know, that's somehow a corruption of the idea of real art. And I don't want to do that. But there is a way also in which, you know, after the Industrial Revolution, like, at least I don't have to paint portraits of popes or, you know, I don't well, know, well, wealthy, by the way, no, hey, wealthy hang on. merchants or something. But you know, I'm on, free in that way. But hang on, Dan. Could yeah. you paint? Could you paint <laughs> portraits of popes? Could you paint portraits <laughs> of probably, dignitaries you hated? I'd probably end up, you know, imprisoned or beheaded. Or I, I mean, like, uh, would you make it I perhaps a pointillistic <laughs> execution of their own existence being wiped out with an eraser? Yeah. I, I mean, can, that's, I'm just getting Dada now, so I don't <laughs> I can picture myself <laughs> painting a portrait of like King Philip of Spain and then <laughs> turning it around so that he can see it and just the look on his face. He might not be pleased. But, uh, I, I kind of like that, but then you'd have to worry that he might actually reincarnate as a molecular <laughs> infection, turning you even more insane than you already are. Because let's face it, we're all a bit we're all a bit kugaluchi right now. That could be it. That could be what I'm <laughs> suffering from. Maybe I need to exercise the uh, molecular spirit of of uh, King Philip. <laughs> any any number of weirdos that are no doubt trying to you know. A resurface into our bloodstream. I mean, <laughs> we all need a bit of ancestral healing right about now because, face it, all of life's agonies exist somewhere under our skin. And that we're both chuckle fuckers is only in rebellion against reality. Yeah. I want to ask you another question just because I like to deflect away from yeah, myself. Sure. But, um, you know, like, I wonder what you think about the state of like art and music and like what direction you feel it's going in. Well, it's a very good question, Dan, because I don't fucking think about it. I don't think don't? about the state of art or music. I think of only individual artists and individual musicians. I think you can go really far backwards to go really far forward. I don't care about the, you know, the corporate nature. I don't care what's popular. I don't even know. Although, look, I have to check what's out there just to prove I have no interest in most of it. But I obviously am interested in shit because this is why this is the 247th episode of the Lydian Spin. Yeah. So what I feel is it's always to me about the individual. It's always about unique ideas. I don't care what format it takes. I wish we had more architects on the show. I wish we had more chemists on the show. So to me, art and music are just the lower strata of, you know, intelligent forms of creation. I mean, we're like the tardy grades. <laughs> That's what I was like. I was so worried about going on this because I thought like, I don't know, part of me feels like uh, visual artists should be seen and not heard. And I, I'm not uh, really I think sure that be, I... <laughs> I think men should be obscene and not heard. So we'd never do this podcast if that was the truth. Well, you know, you know, Pierre so, Boulez in his book, Orientations, he, he talks about music as it's a craft, right? You do this. Yeah. Thing. It's, it's, an art. it's an art, but actually music is also a science. I mean, I mean, I mean, the theory, music theory and, and, and the physics that are involved just to create these consistent uh, sounds it's an actual real it's a real science in fact so you know uh take it or leave it but is it on the lower end lydia i don't know yeah. that's interesting you know like i i think that that's part of the reason why i suck at music is that i was always really interested in music theory and i don't i don't have a good ear and like i i'm i know way more about the theory of it than i do 
than I'm capable of actually. Well, well look, you can have all the theory, practice, and and rehearsing, and structure, and knowledge in the world, and still be boring as fuck. You can know nothing. Hang on, you can know nothing about everything and anything, and be an idiot savant. So it's again down to the individual. It's not exactly what you studied, where you went, how you. It's how you apply it. And what you do with it? How, how you how you apply it? So first of all, music theory is called music theory. It's not called music fact. Exactly. Uh, they they, they, they yeah. actually the, the theories run their course. You have to, tonality. You have atonality. You have, you have pre-tonality. A lot of people think like, oh, these melodies are just from ancient times, and 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 atonality is something against that. No, no, tonality is new. And, and so, um, you know, oh, another thing about theory. Theory are the instruction manuals to the art that already happened. The theory, I theory, totally agree with that. Theory yeah, yeah, didn't yeah. start before the art. No, these are, right. these are, just, right. these are analysis of the art that was made. Exactly. Yeah, it's kind of a scaffolding that goes on something that already should should already be built. There you go. <laughs> there you go. I mean, that's what what's just tra- transpired in the past 25 minutes is denser than the last black hole I crawled out of just to Whoa. make this conversation happen. <laughs> and that black hole would be the cheeky Airbnb uh-huh. I'm in, <laughs> which my room I'm staying in is covered <laughs> totally head to toe in fake grass. Yeah, Pink it was kind of in the kind of read what that <laughs> image looks like. Oh, and here we go. Hang on a second. I mean, there's just so much to look at in this joint. It's impossible. But you know, I'm just taking. Oh, here we got a we got a palm tree. Where are you? Oh, uh, well, I'm in Tahiti right now. See, That's also no- be, yeah. also known as Fremont, Seattle. <laughs> okay. So I'm in a tiki hut in Fremont, Seattle. It's a tiki themed Airbnb. It is pretty outrageous and going to perform tonight, tomorrow. I mean, I just got back from Australia with Mr. Keckler. And tonight we're performing in Seattle at the Rabbit Box this week, Seattle, Vashon and Island, Vancouver, Portland, and then back to LA where we will meet with you, Dan Levins. All right. Yeah, I'm looking well, forward to it. Speaking of black holes, well, how about oh, Black, Mo- black Mountain College? You're talking about these... Uh, about that Black Mountain right behind well, I mean, me, Timothy I mean, Doll. I mean, Are you I mean, psychic? Well, I mean, maybe I am. <laughs> But Black yeah, Mountain College, I mean, I mean, I mean, you're, you're, you have these hypothetical, artistic, uh, imaginative uh, um, school art schools in your mind. I, I mean, how much do the, the historic ones have an impact on how you perceive these things? I'm, I mean, I'm definitely interested in them. I mean, I'm interested in the history of Black Mountain College, and there was a great uh, exhibition that was here at the Hammer Museum in Los Angeles that had a lot of like student exercises from Black Mountain College. Sure. That really, um, I love seeing that kind of stuff because sometimes they don't even have the name of the student attached to it. Um, And I I think there's something really beautiful about student artworks um, that in a way there's a purity to them that doesn't, you know, that that professional artworks can't achieve, um, you know, because they're not about ego and they're not about, your your personality Dan, necessarily i want to yeah. ask you a question dan like since you work in a, a variety of mediums whether it's paintings on linen paintings on paper and then the sculptures of wood or using books and using other fun things when you're do you work in series or do you mix it up like oh, today i feel like doing a painting or when you do you do you conceptualize I need to now do a series of paintings. That's what I'm focusing on. How does the actual series beget themselves is what I'm interested in. And it's also, a really good question. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Ask the second but, and also part. Where you, where, but also where you find, because I love rotted wood. I love rusty things. I love, I love boxes in general and I have a collection, but these are some of the things that just really I'm drawn to for some reason. So, okay, please. Answer the yeah. questions. So um, the first part of the question uh, about series, it's a good question. I mean, uh, my work is all about this kind of apparent order and like systems. The students are following these really strict kind of geometric uh, guidelines to generate these paintings. And I've always thought that I should work in series. So, you know, I I create little series of eight paintings and I put them in a wooden box and that's supposed to represent a classroom that's working together. But in reality, I'm pretty 
chaotic and disorganized in my studio and I'll start one kind of painting and then I'll get excited about another idea. And so the series kind of, um, a lot of them are unfinished or yeah, I'm, I'm scatterbrained and I'm not disciplined in reality. Unlike um, how your students should behave in your fictitious school of art. Yeah, it's kind of more <laughs> aspirational, you know? Mm -hmm. And like right now I'm I'm trying to learn about color theory, which is something that I never learned about in school and I never bothered to learn about as an independent artist. And it's a whole uh, world, you know? Um, I mean, I, as somebody who is absolutely ignorant of theory, practice, uh, music, technology, as a Luddite, or as I like to say, a Liddite, I'm yeah. always fascinated when somebody could still create it. Again, as Tim said, the theory comes after the actuality of what's already existed. So, yeah. and working backwards toward this, what is it educating? But back to my second part of my question, because I don't forget as easily as others. <laughs> Where do you rescue your wood, your boxes, your 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 materials from? Everything is new. Uh, so it, the wood just comes I'm from even more Home impressed. Depot. I'm yeah, even more, just, I'm shocked. It's just paint and stain I'm and uh, hot heat and cold and water. And yeah, I, uh, I had a, a show um, in Philadelphia in September and I, I got all the work back and now it's sitting out on my back porch and it's been rainy here in LA. Oh, and it's getting Oscar better. Center, so is yeah, exactly. It's so improving. it's sort of aging, aging naturally. Weather in, aged. Uh, in the Los and, Angeles. And front. have you, have you considered doing a portable piece of one of these beautiful objects that I admire as I stare at them besides staring at you that I might be able to trot home with me in a shopping bag? Oh, oh, you mean like a small uh, box? Just for me to take home. <laughs> yeah, I you know, I'd like to do that. Right now I ha I have a bunch of fantasy projects that really rarely see the light of day. Oh, I do one too. <laughs> <laughs> one thing that I've been thinking about is that these imaginary art students uh well early on I I knew that they they had to uh smoke cigarettes because at least in the past that was an important part of Oh, the I see where artist. you're going, Dan. I see where you're going. Okay. Carry on. Do you? Well, I know I'm, you're psychic, I'm but I where, where I am I going, Lydia? You want me to start collecting all my butts for you? <laughs> yes, I had of not course. thought of that. I had not thought of oh, that. Oh, I just pulled it out of your head. I mean, I put it in your head, and you're scratching your head because you felt I, I put it in there. Yes, that's right. And now I'm trying to get it out. Um, you know, I, I I was in a group show at this gallery in the Lower East Side, Participant Inc., and I did collect cigarette butts from this performance artist, Vaginal Cream Davis. Oh, we know uh, Vaginal yeah. Cream Davis. Yes, we do. So, you know, with great lipstick marks on them. And um, anyway, no, I'm inventing a brand of cigarettes and I've been working on the logo. And just today, before I spoke to you, I started working on the package design. So, you know, that would be something portable that you could put in your uh, pocket. Would it be a wooden box for cigarettes? I hadn't thought of that. Is there any brand of cigarettes that comes? No, in a wooden that's no. <laughs> no, it, you know, it would be like a regular thing. <laughs> well, in Europe, all of the cigarettes are in disgusting dark gray packages with photos of every kind of cancer and fertility, babies with instead of a pacifier or a cigarette, just to discourage. But of course, yeah. I didn't know that. So Giton doesn't have the dance. I mean, uh, most lady on cigarettes it have really heinous pictures of cancerous, oh, right. rotten parts of the body. Yeah. Well, <laughs> so I mean, and the, and, the, and the Europeans would welcome a beautiful wooden box to carry their cigarette, and maybe even cat coffin shaped because they're called coffin nails. You see, we're collaborating already. Oh yet. boy! I, you know, I like your idea of a very small wooden box, though. I, I'll have to think about that. Yeah, I'm I'm recalling something in my childhood with that I like this could be just fantasy recollection that was a small wooden matchbox. And for some reason I remember having a very tiny furry mouse. You in told that me about this before. Little I was just recalling it again. You but it was about yay, yay big. I mean it wasn't a real mouse, but why would there be a stuffed furry mouse that was yay big? And how did I have it in that little box? I, know, I mean that seems plausible to me. Yeah, it also a seems it could be part child. of my it could be part of my 
early onset dementia or, or the fantasies wow. I'm trying to pull out of a childhood I did not have. Well, let's go back to your childhood again. So when did you leave Cambridge and where did you go? <laughs> I left Cambridge, I guess, after high school. I went to Oberlin College in Ohio and then I moved back to Somerville, Massachusetts. Well, I know after Somerville. College. Well, yeah. Jim Dalby from Massachusetts, uh, part, part of his life. I was a little aimless for a year. I, were, I worked at two art galleries. I got fired from both of them. What, were and, you stealing? Uh, were you stealing? I just had no concept <laughs> of what it means to be an employee. Like, I didn't know that Fair. you're not Good. supposed to, like, disagree with your boss or talk back to them or that, you know, it's not all about you. I, mm. you know, I was a spoiled kid and, um, hey, yeah. Did you, go, did you go to the garage a lot in Cambridge like that? Kind yeah. Of, of that course. kind of little counterculture mall that kids would yeah. have it. Totally. <laughs> yeah, of course. So there was a uh, Newberry comics. All that stuff. Yeah, exactly. So, all right. When, when comic shop, that little mall, what kind of music or art were you grooving on as a teenager in the whatever late eighties? This is why I was so scared that you were going to ask me this Ooh, because I just feel like I don't know. I can't talk about music with Lydia Lunch. I feel too inhibited, My, and I, I was hate, really. I hate it. I hate it all. It's not a biggie. It doesn't yeah, matter exactly. what your name. I don't like you any know, of it for the most part. I've been lucky enough to hang out with you a bunch of times with Joseph Keckler and like the names of all these legendary figures combined here and you just slice them to ribbons. They're only really um, legendary to other, I have no uh, well, idea, but it's what, look, it, it's interesting to know what influences people. You know, when I was in high school, I was really, I'll mention two things and then I won't mention anything else. <laughs> I was obsessed with uh, throwing muses and then later with, with Kristen Hirsch as a solo artist. That was like right, an obsession right. of mine in high school. And I was obsessed with prints. I used to go around to used record stores and look for, you know, extended remixes sure. and rare B-sides and bootlegs. And I somewhere probably totally rotted away in my mom's basement are a couple crates of like rare prints. Well, vinyl. those might be worth some money if they're not molded and rotted. But I'm trying to recall what's up. <laughs> Should we go? What song we dance to? You or where and I we danced, danced to a... we had a dance. I, I don't dance with uh, just anybody. I Come remember on. going to your rehearsal space in Cypress Park and having uh, with some who? whiskey who? with you. With you. Oh, you with know? Sylvia Black. Was that that rehearsal? Yeah, Sylvia was there. Oh, Sylvia, Joseph Greg Keckler. Foreman, Joseph and, uh, Kane. Yeah, Greg was there, and. Um, were we yeah, dancing some to one of the with you and, Sylvia and you took my you took my face in your hands and put it in your cleavage. That's what I remember. Whoa. Well, that's that's <laughs> that's called the boo boo dance. Oh. Yeah. So that's that's the dance. So I you, we that's, not, that's not a jug dance. So. Yeah, I guess it could be an Irish jug, but I'm not Irish. So we danced with your head in my bosom. No wonder yeah. you're blushing at just the thought. All right, I, I got am. You. Jug, you know, band music. I mean, I mean you talked about uh, your musical obsession with Prince as a kid. Did you have any musical obsessions with things you really focused on hating? Like, I really don't like that music. Tim Dahl specialty. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good question. You know, like, I don't think so. Like, I, w I was a nerdy kid and I wasn't part of well, you're still, any, on, Dan, like, Dan, you know, you're, still a, you're still a bit nerdy. That's all right. We love you. Doesn't I'm matter. getting even worse. <laughs> you know, like, I wasn't part of, like, any, like, the punk scene in Boston was probably like hardcore, and I wasn't part of that. And I, I don't also blame a little, little, little skinheady, kind of a little skinheady. Oh, oh yeah, I don't. Oh blame my god, you. there were tons of skinheads. Yeah, terrifying. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Really terrifying. Me out. There were a lot well, of skinheads yeah. in my high school, and supposedly they were like, you know, the good, the good skinheads. Oh, that thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, in other words, you didn't get beat up every day. I didn't, but like I recall one of the, they were the good, the good skinheads. skinheads used to like uh, he he had a really hot. Jewish girlfriend and he used to sing Hebrew prayers to me in oh. art class and he would throw pennies at me. What does that mean? <laughs> what, what, what you know, you know, this? you know what, what the high school was this? What? Cambridge Ringe and Latin High School. It's the only public oh, yeah. high school okay. in Cambridge. I don't understand the penny throw. You don't? You don't, I'm, Lydia? I, well, I'm not Jewish and I, I, I have had I twenty mean, dollar bills thrown at me. If somebody threw a penny at me, I'd whack them. It could mean nothing, but I uh, I thought that in in concert with his uh, singing Shema Yisrael singing. to me in art class freaked me out. Sure, you know? 
So, was he but bad? he was supposedly I... one of the non-racist ones. I don't he know. He was flirting. This is with maybe you. unfair. This he might have been flirting with you. He might have been flirting with you. I I think you got off easy. Yeah, exactly. Because you could have been walloped. <laughs> yeah. Onto into the ground. <laughs> You no, could have actually I didn't, bet you could have ended up in one of your boxes now by just being picked on for not being a punker. Aside from that, like I didn't I didn't really get I don't think I got picked on. I got I, I had a big crush on this like really scary punk rock girl who had a, a mohawk and <laughs> she was like the first person I knew who had piercings. And she really picked on me. She used to like beat me up in high school. Wow. And I, I used to like her. I didn't even realize that it was because she liked me. Like I was oh. too I was too innocent and virginal. But you don't think I saw, you don't think that was like some Stockholm syndrome a little bit? Oh my god, totally. I'm still, you know, I still need a lot of psychoanalysis too. Well, uh, I mean, don't you think, Dan, that's why we got along so well when we first met, because yeah. I'm the reparation for the punk with the mohawk who used yeah. to beat you up because she liked you. And now yeah. you fear me, but you get to bosom me. You get to bosom me. It's been very healing. Me. It's been very healing. Next time I, I make you motorboat me. It's I like, only had. I one guess sip I'm torturing you just as well. <laughs> I only had one sip of whiskey, so like a little bit more whiskey, and I will motorboat you. I promise. Well, now you're getting frisky. You better now, not, now you owe me two boxes. When was, the, when was the, Dan? When was the last time you were tanked? I don't even know what that means, Tim. Extremely drunk. Oh, tanked. Oh, yeah. I thought it was some kind of a sex thing. You know, I'm like a real. <laughs> no, that would have been twinked. When was you know, the last speaking, time you were twinked? Speaking of Boston hardcore, like I'm not straight edge or anything. I'm just a nerd. I don't drink. I don't smoke. I don't do any. Like I, I allow myself one cup of coffee in the morning. And <laughs> I feel like it takes me the rest of the day to like get, get over the jitters. I'm like. You're I'm nervous too, Nelly. I'm a nervous Nelly and, and I have a weak constitution. You know, I, I if I have. If I have like a cigarette, if I'm feeling like spirited at a party and I have a cigarette, I I messed up the next day. And when I was in my 20s, I was like a social smoker and social drinker, but I cannot, I can't do that. Yeah, do that anymore. Did you ever do LSD? I've never done LSD. It's time, Dan. It's time. <laughs> yeah, your I paintings two... are going to take a new dimension. <laughs> they'll two... never be. They'll never be concentric <laughs> again. I have two thoughts about LSD. One is like I have really bad. I'm allergic to cats and dogs. And somebody told me what? three anecdotes about that. Somebody told me that if you if you take LSD and you like hold a cat in your lap and stare oh, into its eyes, you no. can get over your cat allergy. That's either that That's or you'll, either that or you'll end up in the hospital. So I heard that. I, I heard a quote. Maybe somebody listening to this can figure out what the attribution of this is or if I just made it up. <laughs> somebody said one tab of LSD is better than four years of art school. Uh, <laughs> if it's good LSD, yeah. If, if it's, it's real LSD, LSD, maybe. If it's, if it's real LSD and not LSD 25. Well, yeah. well, 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 let's just be practical. I mean, a the, the, the third out. anecdote is okay. that somebody asked Salvador Dali if he did drugs. And he said, I don't do drugs. I am I drugs. I am drugs, which is what I say all the time about myself. Some just so don't work on me. That's, you know, I'm also like, too, I think I'm like, my mental health is a little too fragile to do uh, It might cure you of all your, you know, lins, oh. either, your little problems. Well, I thought of another, I thought of another anecdote. I used to work for this wonderful artist, Alan McCollum. He had a huge influence on me. And he believed that in the 1970s, he was really losing his mind. And he did LSD, and it, he claims it made him sane. Of course. You know? I mean, going back wow. to the, the, the college art school analogy, that, I mean, one thing's for certain, hit a bass, it costs 10 bucks. Art school will put you in debt a quarter of a million fucking dollars. <laughs> yeah, it's but also, you know, like, you try. know, art school can be very, like, Ideally, it, it's mind expanding. You know, you learn and you just come up with new possibilities. But, you know, in reality, also, it I think a lot of people find it uh, confining and stultifying and it can destroy your creativity. Well, and, and, all, and also, there's a lot of uh, criticism in a lot of them. Yeah, exactly. Well, and you know, when, I, would, but when I taught no. one, wait, hang on, I don't know. When I taught one semester at the San Francisco Art Institute, I banned criticism. I, as the Weird. ultimate critic of everything, I'm like, you have to find one thing you like in that person's art. If you hate all of it, you got to find one thing because people need encouragement. They don't need to be told they suck. I tell That's the entire totally... planet that it, the problems that suck, I don't want to tell the individual. I, I want to encourage them to get better. 
Yeah, I mean, I completely agree with that. It's very much like analogous to what we were saying about theory that I, I don't think it can come first. You have to have some creativity and you have yeah. to create something. And then later you can criticize. But if you criticize yeah. first, then you're yeah. not really going to. Yeah, and also, you know, it, it, look, <laughs> find that one thing that you might yeah. like. Wait, wait, and wait, it's wait, like wait. even in doing, hang on, even in doing this podcast, I mean, there I don't know everybody that we've done. I don't know somebody. I have to research everybody that comes on there. Sometimes I thought you never forget anything. Well, I, I don't. I didn't necessarily know everybody who who came to me first, yeah. right? Yeah. So I have to research it, and I might yeah. think, oh, I don't know about that. But the thing is, no, I even I have to s s uh, stuff down my own criticism to allow to find whatever it is and what it is is the individual's form of expression, whether it's for me or not. That's it. Yeah. And I, that's how I treated artists in art school. So you got to uh, encourage the one thing. This question could go to both, but this is going to be focused. And it you. could be our last uh, question uh, well, because well, we do have to wrap this what, up, what, what, even what, though what, we can talk forever. What do you think about the current uh, grant distribution and identity art? And, and, that, and the idea that like demographics have to be represented before the art starts. Are you fucking kidding me, Tim? I'm not. <laughs> I mean, uh, loaded question. Sorry. Well, you know what? I think it's a bad question for Dan because somehow, in spite or with, I don't know how. It's, it's, it's a, you know, you don't have hang to. On, no, no, hang on. He got here, a lot here. of I'll, I'll answer it. I'll he answer got a lot of fucking grants, and that's a mystery. However, he did it, he grants, got them. I mean, look, I don't know anything about grants. Fellowships or whatever. I you will know, say you, that, like, Early on, when I was right. thinking, you know, about being an artist, I really right. began to wonder, like, well, awards. What? We're going to say you got awards, <laughs> no, which no, I no, think no, you no, deserve. No, Excuse no, me, no. I said, I'm reading them on your website right now. There's <laughs> two, four, six, eight, ten, eleven, twelve, or fourteen of them. <laughs> mm. and why not? You should. You're a conceptual genius. <laughs> Thank you, Lydia. You rescued me from having to talk about. Oh, yeah, I don't yeah, know I mean, anything about award distribution. You know, I don't know. You know, and, and you know what? I don't give a shit. But, but like, you know, I, in I terms of like identity, oh, boo hoo! Not enough <laughs> white men are getting grants anymore. Oh. You got to give it to gays and blacks and lesbians and Latinos. Well, too bad, motherfuckers who apply for grants. Good luck. Whatever. <laughs> Do the fucking work. Get off your. Get off government and. Art grant tits. <laughs> we'll go do suck a, uh, some dick like the rest of us had to go give a couple of hundred hand jobs. Get with the program. Nice. Corporate you know that we, we need to do a separate a separate podcast so I can address these issues in depth. Okay. Okay. Uh, you know, yeah. but I I mean my own identity, like my work, is about questioning that because you know I started to think that like. Maybe, you know, look, in this interview, you started off asking me where and when I was born. And that, to me, art is about the representation of freedom, you know, in individual and subjective freedom. But there are these facts about each one of us that we are not free to change. I was born <laughs> in 1972 in right. New York City, in Beth Israel Hospital in the United States. And that, you know is part of my biography and it definitely right. has had a huge effect on who I am as an artist, but it's like part of the realm of unfreedom. So at the least that I can do in my work is to subject that to some kind of like imaginative play or inquiry. And that's why reassignment. Rearrange it. Yeah. Reassignment. Exactly. Reassignment. So I decided to choose an imaginary version of Switzerland in an imaginary undefined past. So it, it becomes, of course, my work is always gonna be about me and I can't escape that nor would I want to, but I want to kind of, you know, have some freedom or some ability to play with it. Well, so or as, I like to say, as I like to reduce it, according to where I came from and where I am and where I'm going, you can take the wigger out of the ghetto, but you can't take the ghetto out of the wigger. And with that, I'm just going to say, this is the Lydian spin. Wigger, please. With Lydia, with Lydia Lunch, Tim Dahl, and Dan Levinson. And check out his art because, uh, well, he's only got about, I don't know, how many students now so far? 132 in your roster? I haven't counted. But there's 135,000 possibilities coming Anytime in the near future. Thank you so much, Dan. Thank see you, you next week. so much. Yeah, see you soon. We'll be having another dance next week.